Thrombotic microangiopathies, or TMAs, are syndromes of disordered coagulation that have profound systemic effects. After this presentation, you should be able to name three TMAs, list three diagnostic features of TMAs, list two diagnostic tests that differentiate TMAs, name the treatment for each TMA, and describe the long-term consequences of HUS. TMAs present with low platelet counts and anemia with evidence of red blood cell destruction. This includes schistocytes, odd-shaped cells damaged by flowing through a mesh of platelets. Lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, is released from damaged red blood cells, so its levels rise. Haptoglobin, a protein that binds hemoglobin released from red blood cells, will be consumed. This process may damage other organs. Presenting symptoms often involve the central nervous system, the kidneys, and GI tract. All TMAs overlap in these systemic manifestations. All TMAs begin with platelet activation and clumping in capillary beds to form a web across these tiny blood vessels. Red blood cells get damaged by these platelet meshes and organ function may be compromised by ischemia. Three major forms of TMA occur. The most common childhood forms are hemolytic uremic syndrome, most often triggered by a gastroenteritis with a shiga toxin producing organism. We'll refer to this as STEC HUS. Toxin absorbed from the gut damages capillaries, triggering other events. This form generally has a very good short-term prognosis. Atypical HUS is now known to be a disorder of complement regulation. This disorder is often familial and frequently leads to permanent kidney failure or death. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura results from unprocessed von Willebrand's factor. Without the treatment, these patients also have a poor prognosis. The complement system provides nonspecific immune protection. Initial activation may be through an antigen antibody complex, the classical pathway, or contact with a number of biomaterials, the alternative pathway. Both pathways converge on C5. After that, the system forms a membrane attack complex, or MAC, capable of damaging both foreign threats and host tissues. The complement system is always turned on. A variety of natural inhibitors keep its activity in check. Deficiencies of these inhibitors allow rampant complement activity and tissue damage of AHUS. A number of mutations in complement regulatory factors have been identified in AHUS as shown. Mutations are not required for this diagnosis. Up to half of AHUS patients have no detectable mutation at this time. TTP is due to factor VIII dysregulation. Von Willebrand factor binds to factor VIII. Von Willebrand factor also binds to a number of proteins, including some on platelets, to position factor VIII where it may be needed for clotting. Cleavage of von Willebrand factor prevents it from clumping platelets and causing spontaneous clots. ADMTS13 normally cleaves von Willebrand factor. If its activity is reduced, thrombosis can run wild. HUS and TTP can present in the same way. 
TTP can be confirmed by measuring ADAMTS13 activity. HUS can then be sorted by the presence of a sugar-like endotoxin producing organism in the stool or an illness consistent with this infection. By the time HUS develops, stool cultures may be negative, leaving differentiation to clinical impression. With the development of effective specific treatments, differentiation of TMAs is more critical than it used to be. Currently, the care of STEC HUS is supportive. While some children can get through this disorder without dialysis or admission, at a minimum these kids should be discussed with pediatric nephrology. AHUS can now be treated with an antibody to C5 echolizumab with dramatic improvement in its long-term prognosis. TTP is treated with plasma exchange, which removes large von Willebrand's factor in the circulation and provides ADAMTS13 activity. For the rest of this talk, we'll focus primarily on STEC HUS, the most common pediatric form. The first step in recovery is clearance of the toxin and organism. This allows the microangiopathic process to cease. Once clotting stops, the thrombi can dissolve and organ damage can heal. The child can then regain kidney function. Several points of intervention can be identified in the road from infection to STEC HUS. Avoiding infections would be ideal. We can decrease the risk of HUS in children with STEC colitis. And some preliminary evidence suggests that C5 activation may be a common pathway for development of HUS. Echolizumab is now being studied as a treatment for STEC HUS. Efforts to improve food safety can reduce STEC exposure. We also need to avoid contamination of food served raw by separating meat from these foods, since meat is the most common vector. Antibiotics can increase the risk of HUS by releasing STEC from the bacteria. A population-based study confirmed this increase in relative risk several years ago. Antidiarrheal drugs also increase the risk of HUS, presumably by slowing clearance of bacteria and toxin from the gut. With modern supportive care, 5% of children with STEC HUS die, usually of neurologic complications. 5% of children are left with permanent kidney failure. They generally do well after kidney transplant. 90% of these children survive with recovery of kidney function. We now know that many of these children will develop signs of chronic kidney disease later in life. In young adults 20 to 44 years of age, the incidence of chronic kidney disease is 0.4%. So even STEC HUS that does not require dialysis raises this risk 20-fold. The worse the kidney dysfunction, the greater the risk of later chronic kidney disease. Normal living causes loss of nephrons. Up to 10% may be completely scarred by 40 years of age. Episodes of acute kidney injuries such as HUS cause more dramatic loss of nephrons, leading compensatory processes to kick in. These processes may stabilize overall kidney function, but they ultimately result in more nephron loss. This vicious cycle continues until the kidney reaches permanent failure. All children with STEC HUS require attention to indicators of chronic kidney disease for the rest of their lives. Let's revisit our objectives and what you should know about thrombotic microangiopathies after watching this video.